Well, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce our final presenter. Felicity Scott is Associate Professor of Architecture and the co-director of the program in Critical, Curatorial, and Conceptual Practices in Architecture at Columbia University. Um, we all uh, are grateful to her good work, too, as one of the founding co-editors of the journal Grey Room. Uh, she has several books forthcoming, uh, imminent, I think, so I'll just highlight one here, uh, Outlaw Territories, Environments of Insecurity, Architectures of Counterinsurgency. This book investigates architecture's relation to human unsettlement and territorial insecurity. Her title, uh, the title of her presentation today is Securing Adjustable Climate. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, um, in a way, this talk comes out of uh, um, a paragraph in my conclusion that many people who see the book will obviously make the, the connection. Um, thank you to Daniel, wherever he is, um, for the invitation. I'm, um, uh, since my talk is a few minutes long, I'm going to avoid my preamble and um, go straight into it. On May 13, 1974, front page headlines in the New York Times read, Proposal for Human Colonies in Space is hailed by scientists as feasible now. The article was illustrated, as you see, with a rather prosaic diagram modeled after 18th century mathematician Joseph Louis Lagrange's hypothesis on celestial mechanics. It identifies Lagrange libation point five, or L5, a point of stable equilibrium between the sun, the earth, and its moon as an ideal site for the first space colony, which could retain its position within this celestial orbit without having to accelerate. Walter Sullivan, a prominent science journalist, reported on an event convened three days earlier here at Princeton University by physics professor Gerald, uh, Gerald K. O'Neill, a renowned high energy particle physicist. Liberated not only from gravity and friction, but also from inhospitable climates, material scarcity, large scale governments, and other earthly threats, O'Neill's space colonies were to take the form of giant rotating man-made habitats, initially in this cylindrical form, that would replicate, or so he insisted, the most beautiful parts on Earth, exemplified for him by Carmel Bay, California, along with the Grand Teton Mountains in Wyoming, the island of Bermuda, and as he put it, attractive villages in Italy and southern France. His space colonies were represented, just in case the ideology was not clear, uh, his space colonies were represented by this time, at this time by technical diagrams, supplemented by a powerful and distinctly neoliberal rhetoric. With an abundance of material goods, endless sunshine, virtually unlimited resources harvested from outer space, freedom to travel, and, as in he repeatedly underscored, independence from large-scale governments, pioneering colonists were promised attractive, self-sufficient, profitable, Earth-like environments. Yet unlike Earth, there would be no unproductive workers, no pollution, no limits to energy consumption, no garden-destroying pests. Fresh strawberries would be available throughout the year. Confidently pitching science fiction-like narratives as the most rational scientific solution to the world's problems, O'Neill offered a truly fantastic, or truly fantastic figures of emigration rates, population growth, and through an avowedly bootstrap plot, the rapid self-replication of space colonies, starting with this small, higher-density Model 1 colony that was later to be called Island 1 and from which the others would be produced. Um, he estimated that by 2074, more than 90% of the human population could be living in space colonies, such as his Model 4. Although not necessarily desirable, there would be room to expand the human population by a factor of 20,000. Lots of room for population growth. Here was an exponential growth curve, speaking not to imminent doomsday, as with the neo-Malthusian systems dynamic studies of figures like J.W. Forrester and his World Dynamics of 1971, and the limits to growth published by the Club of Rome as an intervention into the UN's 1972 conference on the human environment in Stockholm. O'Neill's diagrams indicated, his is on the left, Earth's population decreasing as that in outer space spiraled upwards on account of unlimited resources. With industry and populations relocated to outer space, uh, as Sullivan reported, Earth would be left with few permanent residents. It would be a worldwide park, a beautiful place to visit for a vacation. As indicated in the New York Times, this rosy vision was haunted by a constellation of contemporary concerns or anxieties. 
Columbia University physics professor, uh, Gerald Feinberg, who you see here, as Sullivan reported, and I quote, said that in a world threatened by nuclear devastation or catastrophic pollution effects, colonies in space would provide insurance for the continuity of the human race and other life forms. So again, life itself was quite literally at stake. Feinberg, too, mobilized the Jeffersonian appeal to self-sufficiency and self-government, drawing analogies to the colonization of the Americas to suggest that space colonies would, and I quote, tend to be independent and could provide a haven for dissidents and would offer the advantages of small, independent political units. Sullivan concluded by alluding to a lingering doubt, and I quote, within the solar system, Dr. O'Neill pointed out, there is plenty of room for colonization without shooting any Indians. And O'Neill reiterated this, he said, in contrast to our experience with expanding civilizations on Earth, uh, and he's, of course, distancing himself here again from the specter of colonial violence, uh, that in space colonization, there would be no destruction of indigenous primitive populations, nothing corresponding to the Indian Wars of 19th century America. So space colonization was repeatedly and ambiguously likened to the European discovery of the New World and the ideology of manifest destiny associated with 19th century American frontier, the, the 19th century American frontier. At a moment when U.S. expansion and economic growth seemed threatened by resource scarcity, environmental degradation, nuclear fallout, and political pressures both at home and from developing countries, and particularly the oil-rich uh, nations of OPEC, space colonization suggested the possibility of a continuity of U.S. supremacy uh, and the narrative of pioneering know-how. The New York Times coverage proved pivotal. O'Neill had struggled, in fact, to gain support for his ideas in the preceding years, eventually gaining seed money uh, for the 1974 event here at Princeton from Michael Phillips, president of the Point Foundation, the California agency through which Stuart Brand channeled the immense profits of his alternative lifestyle initiative, the Whole Earth Catalog. O'Neill's space colony obsession, in fact, began somewhat by chance. In 1969, when in the wake of the euphoria of the Apollo moon landing and seeking to counter growing disenchantment with science and engineering and among the country's youth arising from the violence of the US-led war in Vietnam, he posed the question to his freshman physics students, is the surface of a planet really the right place for an expanding technological civilization? As detailed by W. Patrick McRae in The Visioneers, O'Neill became increasingly convinced by his findings and increasingly frustrated by their rejection among the scientific community, finally gaining an audience when the popular magazine Physics Today published The Colonization of Space in September 1974, replete with these types of tables and diagrams. So in addition to outlining the technical and scientific details behind his evidently inflated claim that self-sufficient space colonies were achievable in the next few decades, O'Neill's Physics Today article underscored that colonization, uh, space colonization held the promise of solving not only the US's but the world's major problems by offering an abundant clean energy supply, protection of the biosphere, the expansion of living space, and this figure of Lebensraum actually comes in to some of his followers, and even equalizing living standards. Indeed, adding the question of security to that of scarcity, territory, and population, he claimed nothing less than world peace to be at stake. Skip over this quote here. It was powerful rhetoric, picking up momentum from the Times article and the popular reception of O'Neill's ideas in physics today, the US National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, its funding then in decline in the wake of the Apollo missions and the winding down of Skylab recognized an opportunity. NASA gave $12,000 to and co-convened a second larger conference at Princeton in May 1975, the conference, as you see, on space manufacturing facilities, space colonies. In addition to physicists from Princeton, Columbia, and MIT, as in the first event, it brought together experts from large corporations, the US government and military agencies, as well as from legal, diplomatic, social scientific, and management realms. Uh, actually, it also included Ludwig Glaser from MoMA, which is a, another trajectory of my research here. Additionally, NASA contributed $100,000 for a NASA Ames Stanford University summer study on space colonization that year and funded O'Neill's book, um, the uh, book-length manifesto, really, The High Frontier, Human Colonies in Space of 1977. They also contributed to visual marketing, as you've been seeing. 
Hence, when on July 23, 1975, O'Neill testified about the benefits of space colonization to the US House of Representatives Committee on Science and Technology, he arrived armed with a large model, seductive renderings by California artist Donald Davis and Frank Wadice of the NASA Ames Laboratory, and even a short film produced by NASA in association with National Public Affairs Center for Television. And I'm gonna show a clip of that a little bit later, actually, just to move on here. With characteristic rhetorical flair, O'Neill launched his congressional testimony at the nexus of American know-how and appeals to freedom, again, cast in distinctly neoliberal terms. The moon landing he proposed was better understood not as a scientific venture, but as a prospecting survey for space colonization, much as a mining company might undertake. He ended by recalling that on a recent trip to Alabama, he was greeted by a large group of people, waving, uh, students, yeah, waving placards and shouting, not in protest, but in an enthusiastic embrace of his new techno-scientific developments. So it's a sort of counterinsurgency project as well. As demonstrated in the beautiful renderings, space colonies would establish productive, profitable, isolated, normative, passive workforce communities, living in comfort and even some luxury, he explained, with large enclosed volumes, having a climate where flowers, trees, birds, and animals could flourish. As I argue elsewhere, drawing on DeWitt uh, Douglas Kilgore's astrofuturism, O'Neill's promise of a lush, protected suburban lifestyle was code for racial segregation in America. Here I want to try to refract this promise through another uh, slightly different lens. For the proclaimed benefits and the violent reshufflings implied by his space colonization enterprise were directed not only to forces within the US, but to the country's role in uh, a shifting geopolitical landscape in both, uh, both cases operating in the interest of corporate profit. And here's one of his diagrams of how profitable it would be. O'Neill told Congress that space colonies were key to economic and resource uh, security now that both the oil-consuming nations and the underdeveloped third world are vulnerable to the threat of supply cutoff uh, from the Middle East. Promising to transmit solar satellite energy back to Earth gi uh, via giant microwave beams, you see them here on the left, US, uh, US energy independence would be assured without the political backlash caused domestically by strip mining and nuclear prol proliferation, and at a scale far beyond the Alaska pipeline. Given the scale of the marketplace for his primary product, energy, the payoff for investors would also be enormous. We can put the Middle East out of business, he recounted one of his collaborators as exclaiming. Moreover, taking lessons from the development sector, he rehearsed the argument that was what was good for the US was good for the world, claiming the US would be able to supply cheap energy to developing countries or even provide it as humanitarian aid, thereby overcoming growing hostility to the US as exploiters of scarce resources. Additionally, through promoting development, this energy supply would even reduce population growth in the global south, and with it, as was widely feared at this moment, threats to political stability. In a 1976 Penthouse interview, O'Neill again claimed space, space colonization, I know he's great, isn't he, uh, for liberalism, calling it a, quote, natural continu uh, continuation of greater freedom, a greater amount of diversity, and control over the environment, pointing to a warlike tension resulting from the 1973 oil crisis and pressure on land area as populations increase, as well as rising nuclear threats, he posited, and I quote, the unattractive alternative seems to be a more tense situation in which nations are increasingly threatening each other in order to get the raw materials they need for some massive type of conflict that will result in a global dictatorship. Space colonies, by contrast, offered a panacea, a way to de-escalate that situation on Earth. There would be much less reason for warlike activities than between countries on Earth, he explained, not only on account of self-sufficiency, but also since, and I quote, their boundaries would be their own choice. If they don't like the neighboring colony, they could move somewhere else. If they don't like the land area they have, they could build more very easily without encroaching on anyone else's space. So the need for political negotiation, that is, would simply be eliminated. Yet within such limitless, supposedly borderless places, space colonies would proliferate a new generation of borders, even if freed now from geo geographical constraints. 
In a world increasingly interconnected by communication and travel, the surfaces of space colonies sought to oper offer, uh, operate less like a border between sovereign states, which came, of course, with international protocols, than a police or even private security checkpoint that would regulate flows and movements of people more tactically, managing the distribution of populations, following what he considered a rational metric of productivity and profit. As a counterpart to the ambiguous territorial logics of space colonies, many were left wondering if Earth would become a privileged site for those who could still afford to live in nature, supported by energy from outer space, or if rather it would become the prison for those without the means, education, or work ethic to leave. So it's not surprising that O'Neill first obtained support for his space colony initiative from the Point Foundation. An offshoot at the Portola Foundation, which actually published the Whole Earth Catalog, the Point Foundation had been established in 1971 by Stuart Brand and Richard Raymond, buoyed by the enormous profits from the last Whole Earth Catalog. Noting that it served as an activist arm for Brand, Andrew Kirk argues that Point was an active experiment fostering the design science revolution. That is, we might say, concomitant with Brand's avowed indebtedness to R. Buckminster Fuller, Point served as another mechanism through which to promote revolution, not through politics, but by design. In 1974, Brand launched Co-Evolution Quarterly under the auspice of the Point Foundation, using it to sermonize on his rising fascination with space colonies. While O'Neill was in town for the summer study session at Stanford, Brandon Phillips interviewed him in what they termed trying to maintain the semblance of a countercultural edge, a ghetto apartment in San Francisco. After discussing O'Neill's early struggles for support, the conversation turned to point and the famous $600 grant. So the whole Earth catalog is responsible for the colonization of space, Brand blithely exclaimed, alluding to his savvy ability to script emergent cultural imaginaries. Phillips recalled his idea of putting the grant in Princeton's name, which O'Neill concurred had served very well in harnessing the university's publicity apparatus. This strategy facilitated Sullivan's article and the ensuing media flash. Formerly a director of marketing and planning for Bank of America and vice president of the Bank of California, and with an economics degree from the University of Chicago, Phillips at this time had effectively engineered a dramatic turn toward commercial entrepreneurship and free market ideals among hippies and the counterculture, the Bible for which was his own 1974 publication, The Seven Laws of Money. The seventh law, as Kirk recalls, submits that you can never really receive money as a gift. So when Brand anthologized Coevolution Quarterly entries on the subject of space colonies, he attributed his conversion from mild interest in the space colonies to obsession to O'Neill's 1975 lecture at the World Future Society Convocation in Washington, D.C., a few weeks before the professor's congressional testimony. Brand's interest in the libertarian potentials of outer space, in fact, predated this encounter by a number of years. In January 1970, the Outlaw Area supplement to the Whole Earth Catalog included a small note called The Space Out, an inconspicuous article which in retrospect seems to have haunted Brand's thinking throughout the next decade. Citing British physicist Freeman Dyson, who was here at the Institute, it reproduced part of a text from The Futurist. The answer to the contemporary threat of permanent extinction of the human race on Earth following a nuclear holocaust, Freedom ex uh, Freeman explained, was not found in colonizing planets like Mars. Terraforming would not increase living space very much, but in isolated city-states floating in the void and possibly attached to comets. And I quote him, above all, they provide an open frontier, a place to hide and to disappear without trace beyond the reach of snooping policemen and bureaucrats. Space is huge enough so that somewhere in its vastness, there will be a place for rebels and outlaws, perhaps most important of all for man's future. There will be groups of people setting out to find a place where they can be safe from prying eyes, free to experiment undisturbed and the creation of radically new types of human beings, surpassing in mental capacities as we surpass the apes. So resonating with countercultural and libertarian ideals and with the alternative lifestyle promoted in the catalog, Dyson's thesis was mirrored in Brand's editorial for promoting outlaw areas, described as testing grounds beyond the domain of the law, or state-of-the-art frontiers whose language is still foreign to lawmakers. Despite international law put in place following the launch of Sputnik, Brand still listed among uh, space 
among present outlaw areas. O'Neill's presentation at the World Future Society, which so captured Brand's attention, had a particularly fuller-esque tone. After refuting the premise that human activity, as with material, energy, uh, material and energy resources, be confined to Earth, O'Neill rejected the assumption that any realistic solutions to our problems of food, population, energy, and materials must be based on a zero-sum game, in which no resources can be obtained by one nation or group without being taken from another. It was such beliefs, he objected, that had driven most observers to the conclusion that long-term peace and stability can only be reached by some kind of systematic global arrangement with tight constraints to ensure sharing or, uh, the sharing, equitable or otherwise, of limited resources available." End of quote. Like Fuller's World Game, O'Neill rejected the political mandate of any such systematic global arrangement, presumably a reference to the UN, in favor of technical solutions in line with the evolution of capital. Moreover, following what Brand called Fuller's Wealth Sanction, not only would these solutions help overcome famine, war, and disease, like an earlier phase of colonization, they promised enormous economic profits for nations who got there first. The human race, O'Neill proclaimed, of the urgency to try, stands now on the threshold of a new frontier, whose richness surpasses a thousandfold that of the, Western, the new Western world of 500 years ago. It would be naive, however, he went on, to assume that its benefits will be initially shared equitably among all of mankind, reassuring, of course, potential, potential investments of his intent. He indicated that the world has never worked that way. So in 1975, Brand asked O'Neill what had come out of the second Princeton conference. O'Neill acknowledged an interesting paper on space law, presumably that of Edward R. Finch, a permanent NGO representative to the UN's Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. The presentation, O'Neill recalled, brought three constraints to his attention. First thing, it had to be non-military. The second, that if anything interesting, like new research comes out of it, like information about the surface composition of the moon, that it does, not, that it does have to be made available through the United Nations. And last is that, at least in some nominal form, the community has got to be under the jurisdiction of the nation or group of nations which establishes it. You cannot, at least deliberately, send people out to be absolutely on their own. So Finch, who preferred the term space station to colony, was in fact an advocate of space commercialization, later playing a major role in a business advocacy group called the National Space Society. While Finch was largely concerned with reading international laws to allow for the excavation of materials on the moon and other vital elements of O'Neill's vision, his outlining of the relevant UN resolutions and treaties made it evident that outer space was no longer beyond the law or the responsibilities of attending national jurisdictions. Indeed, from Resolution 1721 of 1961, which stated that international law and the UN Charter applied to outer space and that territory in outer space could not be subjected to national appropriation, to this 1967 treaties, it was evident that the prospective colonies fell firmly within the domain of international law. O'Neill's retort, resisting UN constraints, was that technology and scientific advancement would be retarded if international law does not keep step with the progress of science, a notion of progress, of course, serving the interests of his financial investors. When O'Neill testified to the US House of Representatives, he also found himself confronted with UN protocols, appearing after Peter Yankovic, Austrian ambassador to the UN and chairman of the 37 nation uh, committee uh, on peaceful uses of outer space. But by 1977, following repeated critiques of his proposal for strip mining the moon that you see here, O'Neill decided to have a voice in these matters and established the Institute for Space Studies here at Princeton, a nonprofit corporation that sought to become recognized uh, by the, uh, as an NGO by the UN. And I quote, we want to be able to make an input to UN deliberations on such things as treaties about the moon. We don't want things to be bargained away, which we may very much want to use later on, he explained to Brand. Citing a precedent in the troublesome law of the sea, he remarked, nobody's mining the sea because of those arguments. So Brand, by contrast, continued to seek a domain beyond the law. Introducing space colonies, he wrote, for those who long for the harshest freedoms, uh, who believe with Buckminster Fuller that a culture's creativity requires an outlaw area, free space becomes what the oceans have ceased to be, outlaw area too big and too dilute for national control. 
Fuller had long celebrated the maritime power born of mastering the high seas, regarding it not only as a key to European expansion, which of course he thought was a good thing, but to technological invention. Aligning himself with Fuller, Brandt too celebrated practices seeking to operate beyond national borders and outside the law as giving rise to spaces wherein one could, as he put it, try anything. And so though, as he noted, the term space colony had been expressly forbidden by the US State Department because of anti-colonial feelings around the world, he was going to continue to use it. Adding, if we're lucky, we may enact a parallel with what happened in Europe when America was being colonized, intellectual ferment, new lands meant possibilities, and new possibilities meant new ideas. So totally unchecked. So, but weighed by the rhetoric of a better and more open future, and no doubt visually seduced by the spectacular pastoral images produced to illustrate O'Neill's ideas, many within the counterculture and environment movement embraced co-evolution quarterly's celebration of space colonization as the next frontier. But as recorded in the magazine following Brand's solicitation of commentary, many of his long-standing interlocutors expressed doubts and even an outright rejection of this new obsession. Some recognized the impossibility of simulating ideal landscapes. As John Holt suggested, the environment would be closer at best to the lobbies of Las Vegas hotels and luxury ocean liners, but more likely to be military barracks and troop ships. Alternative technology celebrity Steve Beyer offered an even more compelling image, and I quote, once on board, in my mind's eye, I don't see the landscape of Carmel by the sea, as Gerard O'Neill suggests. Instead, I see acres of air-conditioned Greyhound bus interiors, glinting, slightly greasy railings, old rivet heads needing paint. I don't hear the surf at Carmel and smell the ocean. I hear piped music and smell chewing gum. I anticipate a continuous, vague, low-key airplane fear. <laughs> Even more telling than rejecting the visual sales pitch, biological designer John Todd questioned the scientific claims upon which the agricultural and landscape vision was premised. Co-founder of the New Alchemy Institute, Todd was then working to complete the ark on Prince Edward Island, an experimental bioshelter designed to simulate an almost closed ecosystem uh, uh, and then the closest experimental test site to O'Neill's vision. Toyd pointed out that ecological systems were far from simple to replicate in artificial environments, current understandings of whole systems being entirely primitive compared to nature's complexity. And I quote, when I read of schemes to create living spaces from scratch upon which human lives will be dependent for the air they breathe, for extrinsic protection from pathogens, and for biopurification of waste and food culture, he scoffed, I begin to visualize a titanic-like folly born of an engineering worldview. Citing statistics des uh, derived from Howard Odom's research, he suggested that Island One would be more appropriate to sustain 40 rather than 10,000 people. Oh, and I want to turn my sound off here. Oh. This is the film Nessa produced. So I'm just have, going to have it as background for a bit. Beyond those refuting the aesthetic, scientific, and technical basis of Neil's arguments, others rightfully question its political underpinnings. Even Neo-Malthusian Garrett Hardin, best known for his problematic diatribe, The Tragedy of the Commons, had doubts, recognizing that the brave new world envisioned would likely be subject to totalitarian rule, or that it would be manifest as an expanded domain of hermetic religious cults. The principal attraction of the space colony proposal is, that it, is apparent, that it apparently permits us to escape the necessity of political control, he proffered, adding, but as we have just seen, this is only an apparent escape. In fact, because of the super vulnerability of the spaceship to sabotage by tribal action, the most rigid political control would have to be instituted from the outset in the selection of the inhabitants and in their governance thereafter. Indeed, by 1977, O'Neill was willing to acknowledge that as with a sailing ship in open waters, the most effective governance structure for an isolated group might be far from democratic. A dictatorship is what works, he noted in a later interview with Brand, since, and I quote, there's nothing that produces conflict more than an ill-defined situation of authority. With conflict comes the need, of course, for political negotiation within a democratic framework. Hence, dissensus had to be banished from the homogenous communities isolated in space. If space colonies were cast as utopian multiplicities of potential domains in which groups could maintain autonomy and diversity and assert their distinctions, the identitarian structure, and in fact, so the diversity went 
between, across, like, you know, each, each colony was to have its own singular identity and then they would be different across, you know, that would be pure segregation. Um, the identitarian structure and selection process implicitly evacuated the possibility of opening democratic forms of political space. That O'Neill's politics remained aligned with the neocolonial ambitions of multinational corporations and neoliberal policies informing US-led processes of globalization was evident to others. Ridiculing Brand's suggestion that a democratic process would prevail as evident in Brand's claim that voters will be interested enough to approve the requisite $100 billion, Jan Bronstein insightfully responded by pointing to forces driving capitalism's longstanding expansionist ethos, and I quote, since when do voters, or Congress for that matter, appropriate money for those kinds of projects? They are pushed through by the folks that profit from huge government expenditures, enterprising capitalists and corporations, and passed by the people, like government officials, who profit from the profit. Who stimulated European settlement of the Americas? The British East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, the gold-seeking <coughs> Spanish royalty. So realistically, the space colonies will get started when the exons of the future decide to monopolize this energy resource too. Novelist, environmental activist, and uh, farmer, Wendell Berry, offered the most insightful dissent, pointing, uh, pointing to the many interconnected facets of O'Neill's elaborate and cynical apparatus. Mobilizing every shibboleth of the cult of progress, he argued, O'Neill's vision was entirely conventional in its lust for unrestrained expansion, its totalitarian concentrations of energy and wealth, its exclusive reliance on technical and economic criteria, its compulsive uh, salesmanship. He was a plan to strip mine the moon, presented as care for the Earth's environment. Anyone who listened to the Army Corps of Engineers, the strip miners, the Defense Department, or any club of boosters will find all this disheartening familiar, dishearteningly familiar, he lamented, of the thug mentality of the technological specialist. With unchecked chauvinism and mindless of the neocolonial violence it implicitly condoned, O'Neill's public relations exercise was, as Barry put it, referring to the physicist as a professional mind boggler, superbly attuned to the wishes of the corporate executives, bureaucrats, militarists, political operators, and scientific experts who are the chief beneficiaries of the forces that have produced our crisis. What bothered him most, however, was that Brand had finally revealed himself to be an enemy masquerading as a friend. So I'm going to conclude very quickly around the uh, question of the visual material. So unlike tabulated data and technical diagrams and the perhaps more spectacular use of data visualization and satellite images that require expertise to interpret, NASA's space colony images appear to partake of a more archaic representational and media logic, to be an archaism with a contemporary function. Underscoring the role of visual media within the Space Colony Initiative, Brent posited with typical entrepreneurial flair, and I quote, now is the time for NASA to encourage people besides engineers to get into the act. The program needs administrators who are not afraid of excellent artists, novelists, poets, filmmakers, historians, anthropologists, and such who can speak to the full vision of what's going on. And their voice needs to be a design voice, not just advisory. America and Russia were in space for 10 years before they bothered to get a photograph of Earth. That's pretty arid thinking. On account of his 1960 camp 66 campaign, as you see here, why haven't we seen a photograph of the whole Earth yet, Brand, or so the story goes, was himself catalytic in NASA's release of Apollo mission images of Earth from outer space. Images which catalyzed popular anxieties about limited resources and environmental devastation and were widely mobilized by a range of parties from President Richard Nixon to environmental activists to Brand himself. Space colonies too lent themselves to such an opportunity. Seductive images were instrumental. Space colon uh, yeah, seductive images were instrumental in sponsoring public support and economic investment. Cast as a vanguard, sometimes even thought to be avant-garde, futuristic visions could slip seamlessly from alternative to libertarian to neoliberal ideals and function all too effectively at the forefront of free market capital. Resonating between an uncannily familiar environment and a spectacular otherness, a world quite literally turned inside out, renderings of O'Neill's vision, such as those produced in the mid-1970s, were powerful tools in garnering support across the cultural and, uh, and political spectrum. 
While NASA's spectacular images of space colonization were put to work to mobilize support for O'Neill's purportedly utopian visions of a neoliberal future, with its claims to ensuring American-style freedom and diversity, power was shifting from technical know-how embodied in the agriculture and industrial machinery depicted in the NASA renderings toward a less visible apparatus of information and management. This might help us understand why O'Neill was so disturbed by the systems dynamics model of Jay Forrester, which not only spoke to Earth's limited resources, uh, in their case, of course, in the service of a racially inflected panic about population growth, but prioritized the benefits of a computer-driven, social science-informed management scheme as the techno-scientific infrastructure of new forms of governance, forms that in part displaced the priority of physicists and engineers. By 1976, O'Neill was willing to concede that the first space colonies would, and I quote, be much more like a Texas tower oil rig or a construction camp on the Alaska pipeline or like Virginia City, Nevada in about the year 1875 that the Carmel coastline or the south, of, then the Carmel coastline or the south of France. Compared to a future of exacerbated post-planetary segregation and a return to an entirely privatized form of governance over colonial territories, again, think of the East India Company, the violence inherent to techniques of power informing 19th and early 20th century colonial and industrial paradigms might indeed have come to seem more limited in their reach. In 1976, the U.S. Congress, having lost interest in outer space exploration, amended the Space Act to allow NASA to engage in Earth science research and climate monitoring, in effect switching the agency's focus back to the planet with the mandate of expanding knowledge of Earth. At a moment marked, again, by racially charged anxieties about population growth in the developing world, resource scarcity, and environmental catastrophe, such knowledge was critical to the maintenance of political power, whether directed toward outer, towards outer space or towards the Earth. Hence the importance of focusing here not on technical questions related to abstract formulations of human comfort as manifest in tables and diagrams, as well as environmental management and control, let alone the claims to bucolic Earth-like environments that they were, subject, that they were the subject of his visual representations. At stake was intervening within emergent techniques of power and hierarchical systems of global governance that were being instituted by US-driven uh, neoliberal economic paradigms uh, and, what do I have here, technical credit forms of management, and exemplified in the UN's development decade. When confronted by the seductive NASA renderings, the question is thus not what a space colony environment looked like, or even how pleasant its idealized climates might be, but how we might read the political and economic agendas they serve to advance, agendas embodied within and beneath their spectacular surfaces. These images and their mobilization speak to the political nature of the period's rising interest in climate and environment. They remind us that it was not natural processes or even nature's relation to human as species that was at stake, so much as how questions of climate, nature, weather and resources were framed as socioeconomic and political concerns and hence participated in what Foucault termed the calculated management of life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Felicity. Um, I'll just offer a brief comment and to turn it over to you. We'll take some questions uh, specifically addressed uh, to her project before we open it up. Uh, to hear from Bill Gleason and, and have a, a wider discussion about, about the conference as a whole. Uh, I feel like I have a new understanding of um, the movie Star Wars, which appeared, of course, right at, at the, the end of your story and, and was the new American West. <laughs> um, and indeed, indeed, throughout your, your presentation, I was fascinated with the, you know, the different kinds of language used. Is it a colony? Is it an outpost? Is it a space station? And, and the meaning packed therein. And in some ways, this story is a continuation of the, the Turner thesis, Frederick Jackson Turner's notion of the, you know, whether expanded territory as a kind of safety valve for social pressures in the United States. Um, it also links with uh, Fred Turner, who is a historian at Stanford, who has uh, fruitfully explored how Stuart Brand is at this interesting nexus um, that not only connects the counterculture to the cyberculture, but in fact has deep roots uh, within the heart of the military uh, industrial complex in the very way uh, work gets done as well as what, what gets thought. So, so thank you so much for bringing that all to light in, in such a wonderful way. Uh, that's not really a question, so, so let me uh, turn to the audience now and uh, we'll happily send some questions to our panel of one. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> we can have a comparative competition here. If, I don't know if you want to stay on. Oh, what I do you stand. prefer? Yeah, yeah. Why don't you? Yeah. Yeah. But we could also just move to the final panel. Yeah. People don't have questions. So. Yes, yeah, th uh, thanks so much for that really fascinating presentation. And uh, I thought maybe we could link it back to some of the earlier discussions about the Anthropocene because for so many of us in the room, the most uh, famous or notorious words from Stuart Brand are, you know, we, um, we, are, we are as gods and we must get good at it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I was really struck by that Wendell Berry quote uh, that I didn't know where he links stewardship and strip mining. And it seems to me, uh, I wondered if you might comment on um, the, the, the latest sort of morphing of Stuart Brand's extra planetary interests um, in relation to the Anthropocene, um, particularly if we think of philanthrobillionaires and plutocrats in relation to um, outlaw conditions, deregulatory conditions, uh, and one spectrum of the Anthropocene probably leaning towards the Breakthrough Institute uh, that sees this, uh, these as compatible modes, ind indeed essential modes, of earth mastery um, and whether the, perhaps the genealogy that you're outlying, uh, outlining today um, is, 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 a, is a missing part of a commonly told Anthropocene story um, that has as its um, embodiment in part the break, something like the Breakthrough Institute. Um, so I just was interested in, in whether you had uh, any thoughts on, on that particular the, the, the compatibility of neoliberal strip, strip mining and big green stewardship yeah. uh, and Stuart Brand's uh, role in um, mutating and, and in, in a way bringing the space colony down to Earth. Mm -hmm. So Earth becomes the ultimate space colony. No, it's, it's a great question. Um, and and I, thinking about how to answer it succinctly, um, uh, because my thinking about Brand actually largely focuses on uh, his work at the Stockholm Conference, uh, to my mind, incredibly cynical mobilization of a environment, yes, politics, no, um, um, uh, rhetoric that was incredibly successful in, in um, capturing the imagination of Walter Hickel, I mean, all of the, the US uh, politicians affiliated with the, the US delegation, but also, of course, the uh, imagination of Maurice Strong, um, who was the, the di director general of that conference. But one thing I didn't read, because I know I was long, um, that might be able to help me link back is a, um, a, a small section where, uh, as the having founded the Global Business Network, I'm sure you know one of Brand's other um, um, other hats and not unrelated to his, his as Fred Turner um, articulates his relationship to, to Wired Magazine and, and that whole sort of recasting um, uh, of, of business entrepreneurship is uh, he interviews um, Freeman Dyson again in uh, toward the end of his life and, um, and Dyson you know, had refused this earlier model of avoiding legal frames, at which point um, Brand said, oh, but, but basically, um, you know, if we don't exploit, uh, you know, so-called high seas, you know, the outlaw, so-called outlaw areas, then other countries like China will just do it, i.e., you know, he's still maintaining, even when figures like Dyson were refusing this type of um, um, uh, model, Brand holds his ground. So when you think, I mean, I, I, um, uh, have not been following Brand in the last couple of years, but but certainly his intervention to something like Copenhagen, you know, was entirely about rescripting it into business models, you know, through a language, of course, that that um, remains uh, saturated with alternative terms. I mean, in fact, he will still claim uh, an incredibly um, uh, problematic agenda for, I mean, not for the left, I mean, he's never identified on the left, actually. This is uh, always just a, um, a misrecognition on the part of, you know, the alternative lifestyle movement that Brand ever had anything to do uh, with progressive politics. Um, so, so, so I, I mean, certainly Brand has, after, I mean, Stockholm, he, he announced was one of the um, sort of lowest points in his life because he, even though he helped um, get an anti-whaling um, um, uh, 
uh, bill, or you call it referendum, through basically to distract attention from things like the echo side going on in Vietnam and other you know more politically charged issues. I mean, he he would continue to operate in these global forums with exactly the same type of cynicism. So, so I know that doesn't answer your question back to the Anthropocene, but certainly I see Brand uh, a little bit like Maurice Strong as one of these figures of continuity who explains, you know, precisely why, to come back to TJ's talk, um, uh, things don't change, yes? And I mean, so, so this would be um, my answer to that, that aspect. And I know I'm being taped, so this is, I shouldn't probably have said that, but... Um, <laughs> Always a risk. Um, the Anthropocene um, uh, uh, discourse, I, you know, I, I um, explicitly didn't engage in that in my talk with the exception of um, insisting uh, that the question of nature and the human was always a political question and not a natural question. But, but beyond that, it's not, um, um, uh, I would say it's not really my discourse. And so I would feel a little bit... Um, um, brash in trying to make serious interventions on, yeah, in that, so. <laughs> Thanks, Felicity, that was great. Um, looking at this image uh, and coming back to also the fact that we're in a kind of late Cold War period still, um, I'm wondering about the threat coming from the air. I mean, you, have, you, you didn't really talk that much about the complexity, and they didn't seem to in their propaganda for it, about the complexity of a bubble in space or on a planet where uh, you really n didn't just have to you know, create a, a vacation home. Yes. But you also had the, you know, it's, uh, the possibility of crack in the skin that could, in fact, destroy you at a moment's notice. If so the, it, it's, it's kind of peculiar that in this, in this landscape of the Cold War that you're, you're not only just ejecting yourself from politics too cool, but you're also um, creating, in a sense, displacing the denial of it to uh, the other threat, which is coming from the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And it's now a friendly cosmos that's never going to hurt you because your skin is always going to protect you. And one last little comment that's got nothing to do with that. I love the way you always showed the people in the pictures. Yes. And I, at first I'm thinking, is that kind of some sort of garnish that's kind of cool to know, put a face to the people? But there's also something that is so heroic about the way they're being photographed mm -hmm. and marketed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even if it's a geek physicist or... I, whatever you call that, hang gliding. And there's also this whole kind of reaction shot thing where you see them giving testimony before Congress and, and everyone's sort of under the spell of this new thing. And so I just wondered if you'd thought about, because you do that a lot, you show the architect, you show the designer, you show the scientist, if that's sort of part of this or if it's sort of ancillary to what you're saying. So a couple of ways to answer that question. First, um, I have sort of three different trajectories of this research in space colonies. Um, uh, one is through brand. Uh, another is, let's say, through the architecture. Um, and a third one is actually through, which I thought I was going to talk in until this morning, I changed my mind, Richard Falk and, um, and the third world, actually the, the, the attempt to embrace third world people um, having he heard Falk argue for the necessity to do that at the 75 Princeton conference. So, so the architect, I mean, that, uh, and I, uh, that brings me to the question of like how one could possibly be safe, let's say, or, or secure um, floating in outer space. Uh, O'Neill had this in incredible, you know, I alluded to his rhetorical flair, but also this in incredible charm and ability to um, um, deflect any possible anxiety uh, around the, the feasibility of, of, uh, of his visions. And so, for instance, there were, in fact, threats, and they were um, comets and meteorites. And, and he argued, I mean, I'm just parroting him here, but literally he said, oh, well, um, uh, you know, basically this thing is made up of a, of a sort of wire mesh um, with glass in it, and you know, of course, all mine from the moon, uh, and sent on his uh, accelerator, linear accelerator, and he, um, 
he said, well, you know, if a meteorite shower hits, um, maximum you'll lose like, you know, 200 panels of glass and there'll be 24 hours to repair them before people will die. You know, so he would just answer with a, a sort of practical response as to how to deal with something like meteor, you know, meteor threats. Um, uh, the, the piracy question around those gold, gold Cold War anxieties, of course, answered away um, by the fact that there would no longer be territorial conflict because everyone could have as much space as they wanted. Yeah, so, so uh, which of course is, it, you know, is this insane fantasy. Um, once the moon had been destroyed, they were going to move on to comets. And anyway, they had a whole landscape of resources out there in outer space to develop. Um, as for the, the people, um, certainly, um, you know, one of the things I'm fascinated in is the incredible, I mean, so on the one hand, very normative lifestyle. You, know, you see the terrace here and the imagination of life being exactly like it would be here in New Jersey. You know, once you were in outer space, this you know this is, you know clearly part of of the, of the polemic. And you know, I alluded to the questions of racial segregation. There's a you know very profound type of anxiety around um, uh, urban insurrection in America. You know, these are some of the questions he's countering, and he understands very well that his audience, um, uh, you know, has similar lingering doubts about the future of America uh, under a moment of protest. And so, so, so these are just, I mean, I show these images for their ordinariness and, and their normativity. Um, the actual reference here is a little bit closer, even though it doesn't look like it, sort of uh, uh, Safdie's habitat meets um, suburban America, yeah? That's the idea is that they would be modular systems-based houses, um, but redistributed not in a megastructure, but in a type of semi-suburban landscape. That's, and that's really white flight. It's very yes. seriously white flight. <laughs> it is like an extreme version of white flight. So, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. And definitely him, I'm, his speaking, I mean, he seems to be an incredibly charismatic figure, so. Yeah. Let's take one more, and then we'll open things up to a, a larger concluding con uh, conversation. Can I solicit yeah. the, the, the left side of the room? Oh, yeah. Sure. yeah. Sure. You can, um, okay. in, in his book on the Meteor Lab, Stuart Rand, um, in his book on the Media Lab that he wrote two years after it started in 1987, Stuart Brand talks about, he says, like it's like the first popular uh, video game uh, which was made in 1961 then he wrote an essay on it called Space War which is super interesting to think of the relationship between the more like the military and the academic institution games and all of these things um, so here like I see in a way there is something that is super interesting which is it's a war on space itself as if like a, a more like contesting space the idea of when they're talking about colonies as there are no humans so uh, what is in a way becoming a territory it's not yet a territory but this war with the space itself with how to survive through all of these aerial passages uh, I'm, if you could talk more about this in relationship uh, to thinking of more like the coming refugee crisis coming from climate rather than from warfare, rather from the military. So thinking about mobility in this case and the idea of colonization, but okay. through space itself and through the climate. Um, two things. Firstly, the um, Brand Space War text, uh, yeah, published in Rolling Stone in 1972. Actually, the first, um, uh, the first attempt to recast himself um, as uh, 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 as part of the the Bay Area computer scene and things like this. And so, you know, that was also a, a text in which he tried to, uh, or he did perform what I was mentioning before. This. Um, um, this sort of rhetorical claim that that the space warriors in you know in the Stanford lab at Caltech in IBM were somehow the vanguard of a new radical culture. I mean, this is you know classic brand, um, and so so that 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 militarization. You know, I, I mean, what I was trying to suggest before um, was that that was there 
from the beginning. I mean, you know, we know Brand took funds from the CIA through the Kaplan. You know, I mean, we we understand all of this. He very much identified with the the U.S. military. So this was in no way a real shift. It was like a desublimation of um, footnotes that actually pervaded the Holoth catalog in the first place. So, well, Rolling Stone presented it as a, uh, a big shift. It was not such a shift at all. Um, and so, anyway, I know that's part of your question. I'm trying to connect, ha think about how to connect that to the question of the um, uh, contemporary refugees. And you know, clearly we could say something like, um, my, my interest in, um, in in the you know these figures of human unsettlement and territorial insecurity coming in the period immediately after uh, widespread decolonization movements, uh, enormous rural to urban migration, uh, that the types of anxieties that that those phenomena caused in the 60s and throughout the 70s um, uh, are, are um, uh, clearly on some level uh, allegorical in terms of trying to think about the contemporary situation, but but um, but I wouldn't want to conflate them or see them as analogies. I, really, I see this historical research as a way to you know try and mark out a, a type of uh, terrain or, or set of conceptual vehicles through which we can begin to um, yeah, think about the sorts of anxieties produced when historically, geographically separate groups of persons um, uh, begin to come together and disturb the old order of things to, you know, to cite Foucault. So this is um, uh, the intellectual terrain that I'm working in. Um, I, um, I would hesitate to say anything more literal-minded in the sense of its relation to the current refugee crisis. I mean, I do work on those questions, but I work on them very separately to, to something like this, so that would be hard to make that bridge, so yeah. I think we want to move on okay. to our concluding discussion, mm -hmm. so maybe we can fold uh, the additional questions in, but okay. let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Time. All right, terrific. So Daniel asked me to moderate a closing conversation first among the panelists, give you a chance to talk to each other after a day and a half of presentations, but then also for those of you in the audience to pose questions to the panel as a whole about the conference as a whole. I'm going to start with just a couple of brief observations, throw a couple of questions out there that you can either bat over to the left, uh, ignore or answer in any way you like. Um, I want to take the opportunity before I begin for us to thank, to thank Daniel so that we don't forget at the very end for putting this amazing symposium together that's taken us from cave paintings to space stations from the division of air to the management of perception, it's been a fascinating journey. Some of the words I've been collecting over the past day and a half, fracture, insurrection, incision, invisibility, mediation, inversion, agency, defense, apparatus, infrastructure, scale, time. We have different constellations of words that are about breaking things up, words that are about brokering conversations and words that are about building structures. I've got three questions. Oh, please come up. <laughs> I've got, got three. Nice try. Yeah. <laughs> I've got three questions and I'll just put each one out there and I would invite, uh, I'd invite you to answer any that feel uh, appealing and, and to begin a conversation among yourselves. The first is about tools and resources. So. Daniel said in the opening remarks uh, last night that one of the things he tried to do here was show how different cultural fields have been uh, responding to and dealing with the imagery that surrounds climate change. And I just wanted to ask, after the past day and a half, um, what new tools do you think we need to develop or expand in order to produce or examine images of climate change? What new tools do you think we need? Second question. That's such a Stuart Brand question. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Just kidding. That's all right. Um, how many of you are familiar with the virtual reality device that the New York Times sent out to its uh, subscribers? Most of you know this, a kind of uh, visual extension device in which you 
plop your, uh, your iPhone and then you see a world of 360 degrees. Uh, I, I would invite you also to speculate on future forms of image making like virtual reality and how they might shape our understanding of or our response to climate change. Uh, would you be willing to speculate on our sensory future? And this came up several times. We've been talking about image and vision, but what about image and vision in relation to sound and smell and taste and touch? And then finally, how might climate change itself, rising seas, disrupted or altered ecosystems, human or non-human migra migration, or, uh, or displacement affect the production and circulation of images about climate change. So what tools, future forms of sensory apparatus or perception, and then how might climate change itself affect the production, circulation, interpretation of images of climate change? Go right ahead. Okay. Um, I, you know, I'm more adept at thinking about sound than vision, so I think maybe just to say a bit more about uh, what I also saw as hints throughout many of these presentations that you know we 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 come to where we are today uh, in part you know through the the uh, agency of modernity or, or modern science that is so rooted in visual ways of knowing. Um, so to you know to to find our way out of where we are. Uh, is a possible strategy to turn to different ways of knowing, other sensory ways of knowing. Uh, I'm thinking of the work of Joy Carr, who has done some very interesting work in technology studies on bodily ways of knowing, uh, sensory perceptions of change uh, in sort of large scale environmental shifts, both sort of natural and man made, and would recommend it all to you. Uh, but I think that, you know, in, in some ways, uh, we, can, we can go back to uh, Galileo, the, the origins of modern science, and there was one problem. He was working on acceleration, which is very hard to see, especially on a kind of domestic scale. You, know, you draw the ball, can you really tell it's going faster when it's down here than when it's up here? So to get a handle on, on the problem, uh, he set up an incline and hung little bells or chimes at uniform intervals. So as the ball went down, it hit these chimes, and you heard, ding, 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 you know, so, so he learned about acceleration by listening to it, because he couldn't learn about it by looking at it. And, and I just sort of offer that up as a way not taken uh, that, that we might consider. I think there were lots of hints in, in the presentations of uh, other people that you're talking about or in your own intellectual agendas, of, you know, looking for new ways or different ways of knowing and, and how to, you know, quite literally, after the spectacle, um, perhaps a sensory turn is one alternative that we just consider. The one, one thing I want to say, just to add to that, um, uh, it's for me. One, there there are many artists. There are a lot of people doing listening to the earth, and there's also a whole range of sensors like Geiger count. I mean, there are many many things that operate on on acoustic, not um, visual. However, I'm also really, really wary about the still enlightenment. It's like, well, now sound will save us. Like, right. we, we will represent that. And I, I worry about this, I guess, because um, I think um, immersive environments take multisensorial embodiment pretty seriously. That all these 3D technologies, they're not just about seeing, they're about whatever. And I think urban space today has become an image. I mean, it has become interface and it has become a very sensorial one at every level like where do you not hear the right jingle where do you not hear you know things click you know and in many ways um considering how much we use cell phone you know all sorts of different devices um i think you know but i think the real that there is this real question about the organization of sense though in a rancierian way that i think we can really think about as as a site of intervention that it's that it's um that it's about reorganizing how the senses are related to each other, but also to the to the world and to ourselves. And so, I, I, but I just wanted to throw that out um, as a sort of not immediate, because one of the things I see from a 
from a designer immersive environment perspective is a definite multi-sensorial take, but not the one you want. <laughs> Can I just build up on this and just to return to your question around what kind of images do we need? And, and maybe puts in question this very need for images yeah. in the sense, I'm not sure whether we need any images um, because to assume that would mean that we really need better modeling or augmented modeling with other, other sensors. And then once we've got that, we would have sorted out the problem because we will have represented or seen it really well. And I can understand that from a certain engineering or, or kind of instrumental perspective, models make sense because they allow us to see something or see ourselves a certain way. But I think for me, the way I understand images and climate, they are not separate. So in a way, I can't pose a question of what kind of images of climate change we need, because these very images, uh, they are constitutive of climate. And there is the very, so climate doesn't exist kind of outside, because a certain set of discourses, material practices, we mobilize, we kind of rein in through all these different uh, processes of visualization and representation for us. And I'm also not sure whether if we have better ones, then suddenly we'll have better political or engineering solutions. So in that sense, I think the question about the need for images is very interesting because, but more in the sense for me, as a kind of desire that addresses on our parts as a particular kind of visual sensory humans that create certain kind of imaginarium for themselves. But in that sense, it's the kind of need that is already in place that can create something, but to then to suggest that, I mean, of course we're going to have CGI and other forms of, med of modeling, but whether they are better or more enhanced or connecting more senses, again, I would probably contest that kind of logic that suddenly we add another few layers of data coming to other forms rather than visual perception, and then all something, something will happen no doubt, and is already happening, but whether this is this kind of linear progression right. towards uh, being closer to the truth of climate, or then finding solutions around what's happening. No, I mean, I think we're just going to generate more images. That is interesting for, I think, for a, um, somebody who studies images, that is interesting for an art historian, but whether for, you know, in terms of uh, problems to do with climate, Anthropocene or something, I'm not sure. DJ. Um, <clears throat> I think I, I would answer the question um, maybe in a roundabout way. Um, first, first pointing out what I, what I really liked about Felicity's presentation, uh, which, was, which is that I, I feel like it's, she offered us a history of the present. Uh, and even though she, she suggested that this discourse died out in, in the later uh, 70s, I think it, it very much continues today. Um, and I'm thinking about the recent, this, you know, the, the, the kind of fetishization of, uh, of Martian sci-fi. This way that she um, intertwines science fact and science fiction, I think, is, is really it really continues today from from Kim, St Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy to the recent film The Martian. I think it's it's been this 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 uh, you know, we we worry about uh, uh, climate change denialism, but we could also talk about uh, maybe climate change distractionism. Uh, that, that's a, a product of the culture industry as we know it with, from from fiction to. Uh, to Hollywood, and, and I think uh, if if we analyze its the, the political effects of, of that kind of um, that production, I think that the distraction is that it allows us to think about um, the these kind of um, uh, utopian possibilities of, of exploration uh, uh, that, that allow us to dis that dis distract ourselves from what, the, the destruction that's being caused in relationship to ecocide. In the present, so I'm, I'm thinking of someone like uh, uh, Richard Branson and and uh, and his relationship to you know his basis within the industry of, of air travel, but also the, the this idea of commercializing space travel. You, you have the you have this this hinge uh, uh, perfectly exemplified in this in in, in a way he's he's, a, he's operating in the in the in the legacy of, of Brandt's techno utopianism, but it, it definitely continues today. Uh, and it ends up supporting what we've been talking about, this techno-utopian aspect of the Anthropocene discourse. And so for me, um, it's not so much a tool that we need, or that it, at least speaking for myself, it's rather a, a, a methodological reorientation um, toward what I, what I think is the antidote to uh, Anthropocenic um, escapism and techno-utopianism which is a return to climate justice politics and 
listening to and creating alliances with those who are the least resourced and the most impacted by climate breakdown in the present. And so for me, this, this would be you know, paying attention to social movements, uh, to uh, indigenous movements, to, to groups in, that are writing from and operating within uh, the global south. This is really crucial. So I, I think uh, uh, you know, climate, climate games and the activism that, are, that went around it was an attempt to create and build such alliances. I think, I think that's really uh, what we're in desperate need of, or, or kind of militant research, uh, where we are uh, operating and, and, uh, and working in full awareness of the stakes uh, of the kind of necropolitical present that we find ourselves in, and the possibilities for alternatives as, as they exist uh, right now. Can we talk about images for a second more? Because I, I have something to, in def I'll defend Kim Stanley Robinson in a minute, but, um, but because it seems to me that images get a little bit of a um, bad rap he, it, when, in, whenever the word spectacle is attached to them. Uh, and, and I presume, I don't know, Daniel, whether you were mm -hmm. int intending the kind of literal, you, say, you know, for Debord, spectacle is not like necessarily Hollywood. It, it, it's really, it's, it's calculation. It's, you know, it's capital in, in its many proliferating forms in the 1950s and 60s. But, um, but you, you know, one of the things I know, just to connect a couple of dots with Felicity's, uh, you, the comment you made at the end, and you, you know, it sort of reinforced in, in the way that you used the images, and it was true in words as well, that many of these images, you're, you know, you're right, they're not kind of experimentally, visually experimental anyway, they're, they're, they're not among, you know, and even kind of, let's say, vulgarizations of the, uh, you know, modernist avant-garde or anything, they're, 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 they're like, you know, I was going to say that they're all perspectival, basically. That, that, and th this is even with Levius Woods. It's mm -hmm. one of the, I think, the contradictions of Levius Woods. So one of the, the things that, uh, you know, what the Mars trilogy is partly about is, is a communist utopia. And, and it draws on uh, Stanis Alam and, and this kind of thing. And so at one point in humanity's history, it was possible to think in a serious way and to act uh, on the basis of other kinds of futures rather than you know, the, kind of, you know, the kind of capitalist one that, that, that we seem to be kind of trapped in. So now that you know, led to many deaths and, and, and to many uh, you know, uh, sort of dead ends. Uh, but but I do think that it's in, it, it's very important if we're going to think historically about these things to, to remember that. And so, for example, in an art historical sense, it would see, uh, you know one of my favorite science fiction stories is uh, visually is Elisitsky's Brown series, uh, which is all about the destruction of perspect the perspectival linear uh, instrumental kind of imagination. Uh, you know, and of course, these are completely romantic and, and, and naive in all kinds of ways. Uh, but, but I do agree with, with T.J. Clark uh, on this, that these are the ruins of our modernity. And, and that what we're also talking about, you know, the thing that we used to call utopia, Robinson was a Jameson student, and this is a dialogue with Jameson's dialectical understanding of utopia, that it's about Earth. Um, that, uh, that, you know, that we used to, that there is... The function of utopia is, in, in, in this kind of, let's say, dialectical sense, is, is to make it possible to think something outside the prison house or you know, mm -hmm. iron cage we were talking about. Uh, and, or and, lead platinum. Yeah. Huh? Or lead platinum. Lead platinum, yeah, 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 exactly. Right, it's true. We can keep having yeah. metals. Yeah. <laughs> we do have to talk about mining. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so, it, I, you know, there are different tools. So uh, let's say what, the old, old you know, stand, standard of the dialectical <coughs> image would be one that one could still activate if, if necessary. There are, there are, I think, I, I, I don't know. I mean, so, uh, you know, then how then to confront this, this history, uh, which, which is easy to romanticize, but at the same time real? Uh, or, you know, how to, how to activate that history, remember at least the, the, these, these other histories, uh, you know, side by side which, with, with the one that, that wound up, in a sense, temporarily, because it's temporary, uh, kind of conquering the planet, and uh, and then you know it looks like this cartoon of uh, I would have said actually 
uh, seaside meets uh, yeah. Moshe Safdie kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, that, that's how, that would, it's more like a rephrasing of your question, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a different historical lens than, than the one that always ends up, the story that always ends up, you know, uh, in, uh, in the banking hall and everything. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to return for a moment to the issue of the senses and say that I loved the notion of our being taken out of our senses, being out of our senses, and thinking about that um, in in new ways, and um, in particular the way that the smart the smart takes us out of our senses, the way the data takes us often out of our senses, right? And and in some sense, it seems that one of the challenges is to find a political agency for our senses, particularly when our use of our senses is going to be a source of data, right? As our eye movements are tracked and all, I mean, to, to feel like one's own senses have been taken away from one as a source of, of political agency, right? It just is uh, quite a moment, right? To think about how to give them some agency again. Or convert it into an algorithm for some kind of Recalculation of um, of what this of what collective sensing might be. I mean, I kept thinking about the algorithm as the potential tool that might not, and for better or worse, replace the image for producing a sense of what is. Well, in some sense, it does, and it's starting in the most disciplinary mode, yeah. right? The biometrics, and that's why I love that those visual displays were really redundant because it wasn't happening visually, right? No. Why, and John Tagg has talked about that that in in the devices now that are tracking you and finding out whether or not you're on some list, right? There's no one who looks at the image, mm -hmm. right? The image doesn't, you know, it has no. So so we and we still tend to think of it as an imagistic system, but in fact, it's not in, anymore. So, Robin, are you saying there's a kind of screensaver thing that comes into play here? Because it's arbitrary, whatever is put up there. It's, and I mean, this, I like this runs through a lot of the discussions, mm -hmm. yeah. which is that um, space looks like that because either there was some comic book image that someone thought would work really well to get the public interested in funding space research, or, mm -hmm. you know, you can't actually cause and affect it, but that there is this. Mm -hmm. it, what what you put doesn't matter, but it does because then it becomes part of a, you know, a larger marketing system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's part of opening that up. I mean, part of the thing. I don't know. It almost reductive. Like this is really simplistic. But like, sometimes you have design. You're like the one humanities course design students have to take, and you like just ask them like basic questions, like why do you put that there? And they're like, well, since it's arbitrary, like the machine doesn't care. Like, did you ever think to just like try to do something different with whatever you're doing with that interface? Like, don't put it on the left sand. Like, little. I mean, that sounds crazy, but there's also sites of intervention as the incommensurability between the the systemic algorithmic uh, analytics and the and the level of sense perception, and it's part of trying to also activate that uh, disjuncture between what's happening, I think, might be one site of intervention, because it's still informing how we're going to imagine and still act in the future, whatever we're sticking as an image on. Can I just add one more thing? Yeah. Since I, you know, somebody mentioned this thing that came up last night about the elephant in the room and the phantom in the room. I think, I was trying to remember, I, I think at least I was in, suggesting that the state was one of the mm -hmm. problems yeah. that was mm -hmm. kind of, and it was definitely in, in the back of, of yours. Mm -hmm. You know, yesterday, uh, um, the uh, apparently our Supreme Court um, canceled or, 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 you know, suspended the presidential uh, mm -hmm. order mm -hmm. uh, from the first black president. And so, you know, I mean, it's, it's incredibly complicated. Uh, speaking of Carl Schmidt, presidential order, not, you know, congressional act. Uh, to uh, limit carbon emissions from coal, mm -hmm. uh, you know, burning uh, energy plants. Um, so the you know kind of the sort of very close to the ground political question is, uh, you know, that of course has all kinds of consequences in terms of sy symbolic as well as as practical. Um, you know, what would be necessary? What will be necessary to make that different? What kind of politics? Uh, you know, really ultimately. Um, 
would uh, would be you know not just not imaged as it were as a kind of expression of some other underlying truth, but but really, uh, what, what what would need to change in order for that not to happen? Seems to me like you know, it seemed ironic to be doing this in a conference <laughs> <laughs> without having to, without this, yeah, 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 I like to talk about that. Yeah. TJ? I think I, I would add, I mean, on a really prosaic level, if, we're, if you want to bring up the state mm -hmm. uh, and what can be done, we have to talk about campaign finance reform. Sure. Yeah. And getting, as long as we're in a, a conference dealing with climate change, uh, getting fossil fuel funding out of uh, governance systems. Uh, and if you realize that the fossil fuel corporations are contributing something like a half million dollars a day to the political process to, to advance their interests. How can we expect anything out of, uh, uh, Entity, the, of course. The, the government a, a, as we know it? Um, how can there be any change? How can there be any address uh, of, um, of the climate crisis? And you see that in the, in the UN, uh, in the COP21 mm -hmm. Accord. You see the same you know, um, um, controlling aspect mm -hmm. of, uh, of fossil fuel interests. Um, so how can there be any uh, um, you know, advance toward any kind of solution relating to climate change? And again, these things, I mean, just come back to my narrative, are, are not incidental. I mean, Standard Oil uh, funded the book series that went with the Stockholm Conference. You know, right from the beginning, Maurice Strong, who was, as he said, the Secretary General at that conference, he, um, uh, he was a Canadian oil man who had been, in a sort of classic move, being put in charge of the external uh, aid um, body of the Canadian government before he was recognized to be the ideal person to script uh, a model of environmental discourse in the same way that you know, a similar cast of characters are now in charge of the discourse around climate change at the official levels of the UN and et cetera. So, I mean, I think you know, these things are not incidental. They're, they're, I mean, one can trace an archaeology in which they they entered the scene at the beginning of, uh, of a type of political consciousness. The minute it went from, I mean, the streets, let's say, into any type of governing apparatus. So I, I mean, I, and I don't know how you could possibly begin to break that. But, yeah. but um, you have to point out it's not incidental and it's not new. It's like yeah. Yeah. it's structural, you know. And so it's really um, well. There's tricky. a there's a convergence today. I think that should be pointed out. Mm -hmm. Uh, between artists and activists that are where there's an insistence on um, on investigating the I think Robin you raised the issue of the infrastructure that surrounds and controls images so we can't just talk about images or image politics uh, I think it's important to recognize the, the laboratory of insurrectionary imagination for example is extremely critical of any, any notion of image pol of doing image politics they, they feel like it's it's you can't, you can't even begin to do that when you're not addressing the larger infrastructure of, of funding. And so a group like Not an Alternative, in their insistence on, uh, on forwarding this divestment campaign around cultural institutions, is also a, uh, it's a continuation of a kind of institutional critique that remains really important today. So if we're going to talk about images, we have to talk about that larger um, apparatus that surrounds it and controls it and informs how people uh, relate to and see images. I'm also wondering around this discussion and the, the last two days, the kinds of images we've all mobilized, whether there isn't a certain need to decolonize our own gaze and perception and the kinds of images we bring up in the discussion, and I'm speaking here to all of us in the sense, there's a certain sense of kind of retro and nostalgia about certain visual representations of both the past and the future, as many of, of us have noticed that these images coalesce. And I wanted to kind of tie this into Catherine's uh, uh, talk and another talk I heard by her around this kind of black Anthropocene and the possibility of mobilizing a whole different lots of um, not just images, but kind of visual cultures to unsee ourselves. Because in that, some sense, we could see that a certain mobilization of a particular kind of visual culture we've all produced here, you know, it reinforces a particular notion of a threatened Western man on the precipice of this kind of future, which looks very much like the past, extrapolated into some other galaxies. And I'm wondering, what would it mean to go through a different visual trajectory to bring, not just to bring in the others, but to really unsee ourselves and to see that kind of, uh, not just economic fragility, but also intellectual and imaginary fragility, what we're doing. 
Yeah, and I mean, it, I think it's it's not outside of modernity. It's right at the heart and the kind of structural foundations of modernity. Race is there. You know, you're talk. You just you know the the connections between settler colonialism and mining are there, and they're there in the present, and actually kind of making those connections between those different kind of stratifications and images that kind of um, and you know I think that's if you don't have if you look at the kind of the markers of the Anthropocene they're they're completely embedded in extractive cultures um, through kind of slavery and you know through contemporary mining today and the way in which that kind of organizes a racializing assemblage so I mean I think because I'm, I'm very suspicious of that kind of looking outside modernity for the kind of others, for the indigenous, kind of that's somehow going to rescue modernity from itself, the things that we've excluded and the kind of excesses that have been kind of placed elsewhere, and the idea that that's going to speak back and give modernity the sort of the thing that it's been missing when it's kind of there in the very heart of it. But indigeneity is fully within modernity, so it's, mm. not, a, it's not like it's a romantic outside at all. So that's really important to, I yeah. think, to emphasize. But I, I agree with your, yeah. the, your, the direction of where you're going, but mm -hmm. uh, like Jim Clipper's recent book, Becoming Indigenous, looks at you know, the connection mm -hmm. between the history of indigeneity and the post-colonial and uh, media networks present. And I think that's, that's really uh, important. Uh, why don't we take this opportunity to open things up to the audience. Daniel, if you also have a question for the panel, you're welcome. here. Uh, thank you all for this, uh, what's been a really enriching and uh, inspiring uh, period of time here. Um, I'm just going to throw something else on the table and uh, hopefully bring it back to some of the themes that have uh, cropped up over the last 18 hours or so. Um, not too sure where to begin, but perhaps the Perhaps I could begin with, with a book called The Meaning of Sea Ice, uh, which was produced uh, by human geographers in collaboration with uh, various Inuit communities in the Canadian Arctic. Uh, I'm from Canada, just, just moved to the States like two weeks ago, so I'm still getting used to this new culture down here. Um, but, uh, Did you this, bring the weather? <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I avoided the big snowstorm, so that was good. I, I arrived after that. Um, uh, but there's a thing happening in, in the Arctic with the, with the sea ice uh, where uh, we, we have had satellite representations of it uh, from the NASA Earth Observation System you know, since 1979, um, you know, compiling uh, uh, the average extent over, you know, and um, it, it's represented uh, daily. Um, at the, the, the National Snow and Ice Data Center in, in Colorado, uh, uh, spatially, in sort of a cart cartographic image of the, the whole Arctic, as well as temporally, uh, over a, a, a year's time. You can see the, um, the freeze up in the winter and then the melt in the summer. And you can see uh, the impact of climate change over time in terms of like the reduction uh, of sea ice. So you have like this abstracted um, from local conditions into a sort of a universalized representation of climate change uh, that of course is in scientific um, discourses of great concern because of the implications that the Arctic is tipping into a new system uh, if it hasn't already and what that means in terms of the end of the Holocene and whatnot. Um, but then you have people living in the Arctic um, who have been there as they like to say from time immemorial and for whom uh, the sea ice is an extension of the land, and they, they literally uh, live on it, and it's been an, an essential uh, part of, of um, worldviews and cultures, and still is to this day. Uh, the Inuit are a hunting culture. A um, uh, large part of the food that is still eaten uh, in the Canadian Arctic, the protein, still is hunted. So there's like a, um, uh, it's not only a sort of a cultural uh, activity, but there is, you know, like a, there is a direct ingestion of the protein, and the hunting takes place at the flow edge, um, the edge of the sea ice. Uh, and now, of course, 
there's this ontological disturbance in which the very foundation of this way of life is threatened uh, uh, by climate change. And there's been, in recent years, amazing work by human geographers, which I think is really interesting to read through a kind of a political lens, or lens of um, political theory, where, and this returns me to this book that I mentioned at the beginning of this, um, The Meaning of Sea Ice, a uh, big, thick coffee table uh, book full of fabulous images that are produced with, in, in collaboration with uh, elders and hunters in these Inuit uh, communities, drawings, maps, photographs, and rather than try to assemble sea ice into uh, um, sort of universalized or, or sort of totalizing categories, uh, they focused on the particular singular meanings that sea ice had for individuals. Right, so it's like, what is your remembrance? What does this mean for you in your your everyday life, kind of thing? And it's 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 just a, um, a fabulous way, I think, to start getting at some of these issues, uh, in in terms of um, uh, another way of kind of rethinking the foundations of the political, which, as we know in modernity, has been thought of in terms of like fixed territory, right? Like there's. Um, uh, the, the foundations of sovereignty, um, even although sovereignty has been conceptualized in different ways throughout modernity, it often returns to a sort of ground as fixed. And yet here we have the Inuit living with a spatial and temporal flux of sea ice, which I I is not totalized into like the same kind of categories that we have been totalizing things into politics um, through mo modernity. Um, so anyways, uh, i I'm not quite sure where I was, oh yeah, so this is where I was going with this. Um, this, this whole question of, of, of uh, uh, listening instead of, you know, seeing. Um, and uh, as was mentioned in, in um, one of the previous uh, uh, talks, we have like this um, discourse of resilience that is now sort of colonized adaptation to climate change. And part of the resilience discourse uh, you know, in, as uh, sort of mm, uh, uh, scripted in the IPCC reports, the Working Group 2 reports, you have vulnerability, right? And so you have uh, adaptation, vulnerability, and resilience, which is now sort of like the, 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 the politics in which we are playing out now in terms of how we are responding to climate change. And vulnerability is often um, configured as like a property of geophysical systems, like we are vulnerable because of changes in geophysical systems. Um, but I, I've been playing with this concept of listening vulnerably. So listening to how territory is understood uh, by Inuit uh, in these conditions. Uh, so anyways, that's, that's kind of like some of the things I've been thinking about. Doesn't really end with a question, but uh, some of the stuff just never does. So anyways, I'll just end there. Thanks. Yeah. Just, uh, uh, no, go ahead. Um, I mean, I, I know this work, and I think it's excellent work, but it's also a work of nostalgia. It's not dissimilar in its kind of nostalgia to the kind of the, the man on the precipice, so, because it's about it's about a culture that is already at two degrees and no longer exists, and you know, those Arctic communities are already relocating, but they haven't got anywhere to relocate. It's, you know, it's also about settler colonialism. It's about kind of, you know, a lack of territory and the kind of ongoing violences to those territories. So there's a kind of listening, you know, and it's a bit like the, the sort of listening to the meteorite, um, you know, that they recently landed and you could listen to the, to the sound of a meteorite. But that's about mining as well. That's about showing a proof of concept that we can land on a meteorite so we can mine it for rare <coughs> earth minerals so we can put them in our mobile phone and listen to. So that these things are kind of so, you know, the, the, there's such a kind of uh, subtended material kind of practice to these kind of gestural, you know, actions of listening of hearing, of kind of finding other ways to kind of script these stories that I don't want to pull them apart, that I think they have to, you know, so some sort of theory of strata, these kind of stratifications of the material and the imaginative kind of strata need to be in place because if the politics is, 
in between that de-stratification and the kind of reorganization of spatial structures, where you know if your land is de-stratifying, that you have nowhere to go, and you become you know a, as a small island state, you become kind of victim to the vicissitudes of these really hard borders that you kind of literally smack up against. Uh, just wanted to say two things. One, that the ground of politics is still truth. Uh, and uh, in small t, troubled and contingent, but still, you know, truth, uh, it, in the sense that we, I don't think, would be here discussing what we're discussing without some kind of truth about what is happening to our climate um, that uh, has been produced, by the way, um, partly out of ice. Uh, you know, the, the, one of the most widely cited data sets vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, you know, kind of shift from the Holocene to the Anthropocene comes from the Vostok ice cores, where um, it runs deep enough that, that apparently there's still some Holocene air left in some of the ice on Earth, and so they were able to extract that and measure the, the uh, gases in that air to Anthropocene air. And, mark some kind of difference and you know in, in, in a sense to produce discursively a truth so when I'm saying that I'm, I'm not you know sort of saying metaphysical truth I'm saying you know out of the ice a material truth that is you know what has been politicized that's what's at stake in 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 what we were talking about about the Supreme Court and so on and so forth so um, you know and maybe that's that's a it's a very classical traditional almost old-fashioned enlightenment kind of approach to the question that, but at least it has the value, I think, of countering, I think, the romanticism that is, you know, always a little a little tricky. And by the way, the, the, the idea that there are individual forms of experience and, and you know, everybody has a different story uh, kind of thing, where really, if there is a collective experience on this planet, it is what we're, it is this. I think I really like the, the point you made yesterday uh, in the comments around, you know, query origin stories. And I think that's absolutely um, you know, part of this, just in terms of like getting out of like the dichotomous framing uh, you know, with any of this. So yeah, no, thanks. That's really great. Just one absolutely minor uh, comment, though, to add is that it's interesting that Heidegger was talking a lot about the Umwelt, you know, the environment versus the nation. And I think these some of the questions around nationalism and ex American exceptionalism vis-a-vis -vis, um, the cluster of associations around Welt and what a world is, as, it's, as it gets linked in philologically to, to terms of ambience and milieu, and with milieu, an old Tenian expression, you get into who's the culture linked to that space. Uh, so environment, in terms of the actual physics of it, starts to then blend with all the sociological literature about a people and a nation's suitability to, uh, to, to um, a, a place on the earth. And, and maybe to follow up on the, the point about nation um, and ice and go back to the uh, other question about imagery, Russia has just, I think it was this last week, um, laid claim to the Arctic um, on the judicial grounds that the, what is, I'm not sure people here know better than I do, that um, the legal right to the continental shelf um, will allow them territorial access as a nation state to the, to the resources. And there's a great deal we could spend all day talking, um, talking about that. But, um, and the United States in the same race to the Arctic, because as it's melting twice, um, uh, two times as fast as people had predicted, the United States is um, undergoing uh, what is called the Northern Edge war games in the Gulf of <coughs> Alaska. Um, but I really like TJ's uh, comment about about rethinking imagery, um, not just as, as representation, which nobody in this room is doing. It's been, I think, incredibly um, sophisticated and fascinating conversation. But to rethink it in terms of climate justice and in terms of different kinds of methodology. And I just wanted to throw out, I'm sure a number of you are familiar with the, the art installation, Not a Bugsplat. 
Um, how many people know this? I don't want to. Um, it's an installation in northern Waziristan in Pakistan. And what they did is they took um, a photograph, which was a photograph of um, children of a family that had been orphaned in a drone strike. And one of the legal, the attorneys for um, survivors of drone strikes in Pakistan had come to the Obama administration with this particular photograph. But what they did back in, um, in Pakistan is they enlarged the image. Um, it was the size of a couple of football fields. And it's the face of the little girl who was orphaned in the photograph. And the image that is then, it was designed to be seen by um, operators in, uh, in drones. And it's right next to, it's in a field, and it was, um, the, her face looks back up at the drone operators, but it's right next to the, um, the theme that we began the conference with, with it's um, a, a, a compound that is a ruin. It has been destroyed in a drone strike. And if the US military is able to um, stop the image um, at the level of the drone operators. They can't stop it at the level of the satellites. So the image is, is proliferating. But what I thought in terms of methodology, what's fascinating about it is that it's, it's collaborative because it was a collaboration between locals in Pakistan and Reprieve, a group in, um, in Britain. Um, it's a collaborative, and I think it allows us to think about images not just as representation, but as living practice, as intervention, and to add the, the T that, um, <coughs> another T to Reinhold, as testimony. And I think there, I actually still think there is a great deal of power in imagery as um, bearing witness and testifying to certain um, histories, as a, uh, indigenous histories, that are in danger of being lost as a result of what I call the administration of forgetting, the management of, uh, of forgetting. And I think that it's not a question of the proliferation of images in terms of an accumulation of truth so much as, um, as an ability to testify and keep alive certain memories <coughs> and narratives that, otherwise, um, would other, would, that, that would otherwise be consigned to oblivion as an act of, act of active transformation rather than just representation. Another addition to that comment, uh, I think, is um, in relationship to ICE, is uh, the Gruelic productions in Manavut, which is an important indigenous source of, uh, of self-production of uh, film and video and media systems that attempt to you know, bear witness and testify to the changing conditions of the climate from the perspective of Inuit people. Um, so I think it's, it's not just a matter of, um, of listening, but also you know, what we listen to. So I, think, I think that's a, a really uh, crucial uh, resource to reorient our, our methodologies of, of sensing. I can <coughs> say something in response to your first point, too, about um, security in the polar region, we were talking about image regimes, and one of the regimes that we still live under, um, despite the passage of centuries, is the Mercator projection map, which is what Google Maps still uses. And one of the curious things about the Mercator projection, we all know that Greenland is, you know, 14 times larger than it should be, or whatever. And, but that as you go to the poles, it becomes infinite. It's asymptotic, so that the poles literally fall off the map. And so there's a way in which that projection makes the poles these unreal regions. And, and it's interesting that during the Second World War, um, there were a number of, of US uh, cartographic specialists working with the Defense Department uh, who became very concerned that, that the Mercator projection gave a misleading sense of how far away the US was from Russia and from Japan. Mm -hmm. and so they started to promote a map that was in Life magazine with the North Pole in the center to show how close these, these places were. And it's kind of interesting. I think we're coming around to another, another moment. But, that, but thinking about you know, how we represent the globe and, and all that, I think it's the, the, what regimes are used is, is important. Do we have time for? Oh. Well, I just want to sort of jump in and, and offer a sort of uh, intervention in the form of an expression of gratitude, basically, uh, which is, and, and Rob, I invite you to sort of participate in, in this as well. And it's in part to say that, you know, in this position that I've 
had the chance to occupy here through the PEI that's focused on this question of the environment and humanities, right? That, that it's been a real opportunity, uh, you know, in sort of very pragmatic terms of, of soliciting contributions from a range of different fields to, to, to sort of bring some of these different issues to bear. And I think it's also, you know, sort of in a way, very different context, but sort of playing off of some of the things that TJ was just saying. Uh, attempting to understand the stakes of the sort of institutional politics that we all, as sort of scholars and, and participants in various institutions, uh, deal with. And, and so I'm, I'm thinking in part, to, it's in part to express this sort of level of gratitude uh, on the terms of the kind of vulnerability that, that our sort of disciplinary selves experience, right, to sort of being uh, thrust into these situations that are somewhat more amorphous, right, and have a different set of stakes. And also sort of more collectively to begin to try to understand how this uh, sort of intrusion almost of the environmental humanities on our broader uh, set of, of scholarly practices uh, has, has begun to, I think, disrupt some of the models that we're familiar with and, and encourage us to sort of think through uh, our methods and our narratives on slightly different terms. So it's in that sense that I'm really appreciative. You know, I was joking to somebody at lunch that it, to some extent this was an opportunity for me to sort of bring my current reading list uh, into uh, physical formation in the form of this symposium and have really uh, generated a lot of interesting ideas and I've been sort of madly taking notes as we go, right, of uh, different ways of thinking through these sets of issues. But I guess I want to both, uh, again, sort of, you know, we'll do another sort of official thing in a moment, but sort of recognize, right, that sort of sense of, uh, again, sort of vulnerability that one, one might experience on those sort of terms, but also to sort of turn that into a question or a sort of broad set of discussions that we might be able to have about some of the challenges of sort of meeting, uh, meeting those disciplines across, how the image both facilitates perhaps and disrupts some of those conditions and allows us to talk about different things and we might sort of talk about in our homes, if we even see ourselves as having, you know, sort of home disciplines uh, anymore, aside from perhaps kind of institutional uh, necessity. So I don't want to preempt what you might have had in mind, Rob, but I, I wonder if that's also something that, you know, that you might have some idea. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks uh, to everybody here, and especially to Daniel for having the creativity to uh, envisage this future, which we've, we've just lived through. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as I heard the panel, I, I heard a number of resonances across, uh, from, you know, uh, Oriton and Jana and, and uh, Robin and Felicity, um, that made me think that um, the baseline of, of a good deal of our thinking has been white flight and white flights of fancy that render black lives immaterial. Um, and b by white flight, I mean white flight and allied uh, um, enclave elites uh, around the world. Uh, and something that I, I thought might be useful to reflect on uh, in relation to uh, image regimes is the discrepant image making power of people who are immobilized in place and people who visit tourist regimes. Uh, and so I was thinking of this particularly in relation to um, the Labaius Woods and this idea of the trauma safari uh, and the, the scab or the wound that becomes the representation of Sarajevo or the Niger Delta. And I know uh, Zina uh, Sarawiwa, Ken Sarawiwa's daughter, who the artist, feels very strongly about this, about uh, the Niger Delta, that it is uh, kind of frozen in time as a wound. And so, th the one hand, you have the risk of s the suppression of trauma. The, on the other hand, you have the risk of people um, having to inhabit a set of expectations imposed by more powerful image makers from the outside that this is uh, a wounded place uh, and, and you're dutifully visiting it uh, and the, that that becomes part of the economy of survival in a sense. Uh, and that brings me back to, to Robin, your talk about uh, the Sierra Club calendar uh, and I thought you gave a brilliant reading of it within a national frame but I was also wondering about the circulation of those image expectations transnationally. Um, uh, and I'll ground this in a particular incident. In, in the late 80s, I had reason to go into the uh, South African Embassy in New York, 
And I noticed that there were 14 posters on the wall. This was right, right at the tail end of apartheid. 14 posters, uh, 24 posters on the wall, and not one of them had a human being in it. Uh, that humans meant friction, humans meant history. Uh, and so it was, uh, these, these posters were a touristic pitch to Americans, uh, and I thought uh, spoke within a recognizable tradition of the absence of troubling history. At that very moment, in fact, that same year, uh, under the state of emergency, the South African regime had declared the camera an insurrectionary instrument. And by that, they, simply, they didn't simply mean uh, that they were trying to su uh, suppress the circulation of images in the, uh, in the manner of, of post-Vietnam War, but that the cause of protest was the presence of cameras that uh, people who had no reason to be discontent, in other words, black South Africans, became, they performed discontent when a camera appeared. Uh, so th those were two very different, uh, I mean, two, two utterly remote, but in some sense connected ideas of the power of the image and the agency of the camera. And so I was thinking about the impact on, just w as the impact of the trauma safari, the impact on the wilderness safari, particularly in East Africa and Southern Africa, of a Sierra Club style tradition uh, whereby human history or human presence becomes a taint. So the people uh, who are empowered financially and historically traveling with a set of imagistic expectations and the role that that might play in uh, generating a politics of conservation refugees and generating or, or obstructing uh, forms of, uh, of ecosystem management that involve coexistence that these touristic images preclude. So I thought this question of race and, and image regimes uh, was, was a thread that was running through some of the, some of the talks. Well, it's, it's certainly a huge thing in m most of my work, which is actually uh, often about race warfare in the United States, um, but not this particular talk. But um, I guess I want to add like an extra layer to that concern, uh, which is I'm I'm really obsessed with 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 inhuman. I I'm worried about those algorithms pretty heavily, and those are outside of our sensory perception, and the images are coming as lag. My um. You know, I, I'm going to have to think a lot harder, I mean, in terms of the trauma safari and, and Woods in himself, because on one hand I was placing him as, if the image is already too late, what kind of image do you make about space that's not going to re-territorialize it the way that, you know, some of our images of architecture do, but at the same time, and it has a temporality that's outside, or or at a different temporality than um, the kind of immediacy of a, the immersive, responsive environment um, to which we could include things like drone warfare. So that, you know, on one hand, I, I'm, in, I'm enamored with these projects. On the other hand, like, they really want to automate those drones totally, at which point, like, you're dealing with a whole other ethical and political regime uh, because it's not going to be... You know, so the ethics of algorithms or their politics or their capacity to feel is, is you know, that's a whole other thing. Um, so, I, so I don't know if that answers, except that I'm, I'm thinking really hard about it and sort of also about the way that, um, that these histories of race and stuff have contributed so, so much of this urban planning and this, um, so much of this space and everything have emerged out of kind of negotiating race and decolonizing warfares, right? Um, but then it's kind of getting encoded now at another level outside of the human sensory apparatus because it's already in these computer systems that are managing these things. And so one of the questions is sort of what are the strategies that you have to intervene with that, or you know, what? How do you think about creating images that are at a different temporality or scale that can kind of intervene in, in the in the kind of computational logics that I'm worried about? Um, 
Can I just add to this, kind of, with regard to this kind of trauma safari, when you think about the phenomenon of urban exploration, and that's precisely the kind of incarnation of that phenomenon within one particular culture. And obviously, Bradley Garrett, with his book about urban explorers, has been slated precisely for kind of embracing this kind of upper middle class hobby for boys from wealthy homes just going into these properties and with their expensive photographic equipment and creating this kind of sense of doom and gloom and beautiful photographic representations and then returning to their kind of safe lives. So you almost experience the ruin as a film set that is accessible to certain kind of able-bodied young males and that kind of, you know, those forms of flight then you can kind of flit in and out of within particular urban spaces while others are living through their own urban squalor without either the capacity or represent or <coughs> without the, either des desire, the need to, to turn it into some kind of images because so that in itself is, is kind of troubling. But at the same time, nor do I want to shut down the question of encounter and the demand for witnessing. So, you know, it's a it's a, it's a, like there's not an answer to that question except that there's always asymmetries and clearly certain people are more capable and more capable of creating images and circulating them at the same time, nor do you want to forestall occasionally alliances between those asymmetrical groups, you know, so. Um, Maybe this is a question Which of encounter. We it is a question originally. of a yeah. kind of performance of something dressed up as encounter. Mm -hmm. Which, in fact, you don't encounter anything. You encounter your own uh, if they go into these kind of empty buildings and photograph them and pose right. themselves in, in them. It's just almost it's a withdrawal of encounter at the expense mm -hmm. of creating some kind of uh, film sets, basically and, uh, dressed up as wound. And also, I mean, the, a lot of what we've been talking about, the human and the kind of speciation, and, you know, that just very basic question of who gets to count as human that kind of runs through the whole history of the Anthropocene. And, you know, where you make images in the kind of Black Lives Matter, you know, you have images. You have images of murder, you have images, but it doesn't matter. And it, you know, and actually, you know, this impossibility of making that matter is kind of, is, is also, the kind of politics of that, um, you know, of that witnessing. You know, the uh, I, it's a wonderful um, intervention. I really mm -hmm. like the the white flight and white flights of fancy. In fact, that that line, you know, and Whitey's on the moon, mm -hmm. kept coming back to me in a number in a number of the talks. Um, I I love your you know your provocative question about how the this Sierra Club is aesthetic, if we call it that. Um, how that affected the construction of, of outdoor recreational experience for American tourists abroad and what effects that might have had. And I, and I don't know enough to answer that. I think it's a fabulous question. And also just, just to what extent, what extent was that aesthetic exported successfully, you know, and what efforts were made? And I, I, that, I, I still need to learn much more about that. I also love, though, your, your remark about, about this question of the effect of cameras on subjects. I, I do know the American context best because I'm basically an Americanist. So one thing I think is interesting though is that the heyday of the Sierra Club wilderness calendar where all the people are eradicated is the same moment in which there's tremendous anxiety about the effects of cameras on human subjects and their behavior. So and it's really focused in the early 1960s, partly in the wake of the um, Kennedy-Nixon debate in the wake of uh, the televised murder of Lee Harvey Oswald on television. So there's a lot of concern about what cameras are doing. And in 65, the Supreme Court, Nasty versus Texas, says it's unconstitutional violation of due process to have cameras in courtrooms because of all, and they go through all the horrible effects that cameras have on people. So it's kind of an interesting thing that this is going on at the same, at the same time, right? That the cameras seem to have this nefarious kind of uh, agency. Right. And, and part of it, too, can again, can be read in terms of identity, because it's really the white men who are freaking out that they have to perform, because right? they're not supposed to have to perform for anybody. Right? They should be behind closed doors just doing their white guy thing. Right? And, and, and there's also huge anxiety, because Paul Robeson goes before the House Committee on Un-American Ways and does this incredible performance and kind of blows everyone away. And it's like, whoa, you know, we, gotta, we have to worry about performance in civic spaces. 
right? Because that's that could be a problem. So anyway, just really interesting issues to crop up. Folks, I think it's time to declare this after the spectacular symposium. Um, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists, our organizer, and yourselves.